Um, I'm extremely excited to present our research on the batteries and electrocatalysis. For the sake of the time, most of my effort will be spending on the batteries today. Um, and obviously we'll be focusing on how we utilize synchrotron X-rays to understand solid state electrochemistry in inorganic battery materials. Um, to start with, I would like to give a very brief introduction of lithium ion batteries. And I've seen earlier talks of this special symposium. Um, there are quite a few uh, talks related to lithium ion batteries already. So I don't think I need to go too deep about introducing the concept. So as an electro person, uh, I, I tend to think that the electro materials are very critical in, uh, uh, and in any given batteries. For example, here I show you the design of the conventional rocking chair rocking chair lithium ion batteries where you have a cathode on one side, the anode on the other side. And obviously you need to have the electrolyzed wall for lithium ions to conduct. And usually you also need to have a separator to physically separate the anode from the cathode in order to uh, uh, limit the, the possibility of sh uh, cell shorting. Um, so this battery has been, uh, the concept has been developed for about 40 years and we are seeing uh, batteries in, in a, a range of different applications ranging from very low energy batteries, such as batteries in, in iPhones and batteries in Mac Airs. And uh, uh, I still use the example of iPhone 7 and, 20, and also Mac Air 20, 2015 because I'm a, I'm a system professor. I cannot afford uh, better laptops or iPhones. Now, if you advance further to a higher energy device, for example, Tesla uh, uh, Model S, um, you are talking about much larger energy uh, in range between uh, 60 to 100 kilowatt hour. And that's how much energy you're gonna put inside this very confined space. Um, I give you some examples uh, about the, the scale of the energy uh, using bacon cheeseburger and also the lightning flash. Um, we are really putting a lot of energy in this confined space, um, which means the safety of lithium ion batteries is, is a very critical issue. And uh, when we talk about increasing the energy density of lithium ion batteries, we also need to consider the safety and two of them don't really get along very well. And, and obviously if we go up uh, another level to energy, energy storage plants, we, now we are talking about megawatt hour level. And in this case, you can store electricity that are generated, that is generated from renewable energy uh, resources, such as solar energy or wind energy, and store that electricity into batteries. And that will potentially make uh, renewable energy uh, wherever and whenever it's needed. So there are, there are a lot of applications about lithium ion batteries, and I don't need to empathize the importance of lithium ion batteries. Um, the history um, uh, of lithium ion batteries, my postdoc Lin Chin made this very nice timeline on the development of lithium metal batteries and lithium iron batteries, and uh, specifically focusing on uh, the progress of the electro materials. Um, everything started about 1970s, um, and then uh, it took about close to 40 to 50 years, and until last year, the the, the, the pioneers in lithium ion batteries were awarded Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2019. Uh, there, are, there are so many important names on this slide and they, the, 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 the names here are basically demonstrating the usefulness of different electrical materials that we are investigating today. Um, uh, the development of lithium ion batteries, uh, I would say battery, chem batteries chem battery chemistry in general over the last few years, uh, last 10, 20 years, has been advanced because of the advanced uh, characterization techniques that we are, uh, uh, people are developing, uh, in particular, synchrotron X-rays. Um, now you go to literature trying to read battery papers. It's quite difficult to find uh, many papers that do not use synchrotron X-rays. So we recognize the importance of synchrotron X-rays and we notice that we're uh, no review articles about how single-tone x-rays can benefit the development of, of batteries. So we rolled up this review in 2017 uh, with a, a lot of uh, scientists in this field to summarize 
how synchrotron X-rays can benefit the development of, uh, of rechargeable batteries. So if you are interested, uh, you can go to uh, check this review out. Um, now, in terms of the, uh, what kind of scientific questions that can be answered by using synchrotron X-ray techniques. So we are uh, designing this, uh, making this scheme to show you the challenges of battery science at different, different length scales. Uh, for example, if we are talking about several angstroms to several nanometer uh, range, uh, for example, the surface and interfaces, um, surface and interfaces are very important for batteries because that's the, the first place that lithium ion uh, will interact with your electron materials or electrolyte. Um, uh, typical features such as SEI, which is the uh, solid electrolyte interface, uh, the uh, interface layer that form on the anode side. That's essentially the reason why lithium ion batteries can operate. Um, on the cathode, uh, we can name the interface of the cathode as, as cathode electron interface, but the CEI is typically less stable compared to SEI. Um, and sometimes we will need to investigate the surface phase on different electrical materials or solid state electrolyte. And these are related to some of the key challenges in the batteries. And these are the battery terminologies, impedance, rate capability, reversibility, all related to this. For this kind of uh, scientific questions, we will need to have synchrotron X-rays that are surface sensitive. And uh, hopefully it can also provide uh, depth profiling. For example, XPS, uh, tender XPS, soft X-ray XPS, a hard XPS, you can do uh, different depth profiling. You can also do, for example, uh, soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy, get, uh, having different detection modes. You can protect the surface, uh, different uh, uh, information on the surface. Um, now, if we go to another length scale to individual particles, uh, here I, I have individual particles ranging from tens of nanometers to hundreds of microns. Um, depending on who you are talking to, there are people who are developing nanomaterials and hoping that nanomaterials will enable uh, better batteries. There are also people developing larger particles. Uh, for us, we are uh, exclusively working on uh, particles that are in micron size. For example, here I have some of this uh, lithium ion phosphate particle that are uh, that's, uh, agglomerated with nano sized particles. Uh, form the secondary particle, micron size. Um, electronic structure and crystal structure are very important. Uh, electronic structure meaning that uh, uh, a very simple example would be the oxidation state of your uh, uh, reacting species inside the electrical materials. Um, any uh, batteries, electrical materials, they, they operate the electrochemistry, they provide the capacity because they have redox reactions. They are taking electrons or releasing electrons from, from the orbitals. So understanding how electrons interact with the molecular orbitals is very important. That's part of the electronic structure. Crystal structure is also very important. Um, uh, we are intercalating lithium into the electron materials. We are taking lithium out from the electron materials and the crystal structure really determines the diffusion uh, at the barrier or the migration barrier of uh, lithium ions. And the grain orientation as well. I will give some examples on the grain orientation. And for this kind of questions, you will need to have bulk sensitive technique. For example, hard XAS. So that the, the hard XAS, they can penetrate uh, deep uh, into your batteries. And I know that from previous talk, Jerry also introduced some of the work using pouchy cell and looking at hard XAS and XFs. Um, and we want to operate these experiments both in the in situ environment and also the as environment. And if you go up to other land scales, there are a range of different kinds of scientific questions that, that can be answered by using synchrotron X-rays. Uh, something that's becoming very important is about reducing the cost and also achieving green chemistry. And that's related to how we can better design materials synthesis. We can modify the thermal profile, for example. Can we synthesize the material that at lower temperature? Uh, so that we can reduce the cost of manufacturing. Can we recycle battery materials uh, and, and reform battery materials after recycling and put that in the new, ba new batteries? And all of this will require uh, the understanding of how materials transform during, during synthesis. 
Um, for this, uh, people are developing in situ or random experiments to understand the material thin phase process. And sometimes uh, you will need to have high pressure reaction conditions or high temperature reaction conditions. Uh, typically in the, in, the, in the reaction, you have a large scale reaction uh, where you need to have a, a bulk sensitive technique that can penetrate through your reactors. So these are the challenges we saw uh, that we thought that could be very important for uh, uh, connecting single tron X-rays and, and battery sciences. Now, um, here I, I break down the battery electrochemistry in, uh, to different land scales, um, all the way from this atomic land scale. So if we are talking about a material, we will need to say, how do we stabilize this material? And doping chemistry is one of the most successful strategies that people are using. So if you, you dope, for example, here I have a lithium nickel oxide material, and we can dope that with magnesium and, and titanium. And the doping control is really at the atomic scale. We want to know which kind of lattice, lattice site that dopants will occupy. And going up to a uh, larger length scale, nanometer length scale, we are talking about this I mean, it's really still an atomic structure here. We have the bright doors are transition metal columns and the dark columns are lithium ions uh, channels. So you want to have these channels open in order to have lithium ions to integrate. Okay. And if we go to a, another land scale, having uh, primary particles agglomerated to form secondary particles. Um, and this kind of design that the, the polycrystalline materials forms the basics of what we are using today in a lot of uh, uh, practical batteries, uh, they are polycrystalline materials. And in order to have redox reactions to operate, um, all of this secondary particle, they, are consist, they, they consist of millions or billions of unicells, lattices. And you want to assess the redox reaction at every single transition metal site in the particle, then you are operating something in century, it's called a bulk elastochemistry. So you won't have redox reactions. I'm going to have more introduction of this uh, result, the, the colorful result here in later slides. But this gives you an uh, just an example of what I mean by bulk elastochemistry. Um, and then going up to another land scale, we can talk about the electrodes, uh, which will not be part of today's talk. Um, the surface chemistry is also very important. So for example, if I have these open channels and all of a sudden the open channels are filled by transition metals in the lithium channel, then you will be impeding the lithium intercalation and deintercalation. Okay, so the surface chemistry also uh, matters. So these are really representing the scientific challenges of battery materials in, in multi lens scales and single cell X ray covering or essentially every single lens scale that we can consider in designing battery materials. And that's why we are so fascinated about. Uh, lithium-ion batteries uh, and, and single tron X-rays. So here I'm giving you an example of material that we are developing. Uh, this is very old material, I would say. It's about uh, layer oxides. Um, you have transition metals occupying in here in the blue, and then oxygens form on the, on the corner, and then you have lithium ions intercalated. And today people are trying to increase the nickel content and reduce the cobalt content just because uh, nickel rich can provide higher energy density and cobalt is very expensive and toxic. So uh, nickel rich is the way to go. Now, how does this material perform uh, structurally if we are taking lithium out or putting lithium back in? Uh, it turns out that uh, if we break this down into different lattice parameters, A lattice parameter, C lattice parameter, A and B are equivalent to each other. Uh, so we, I, we, we only have A and C here and also the lattice volume. As we are charging, moving from the left-hand side of the, of the uh, x-axis to the right-hand side, we are taking lithium out. That means you are charging your battery. Um, when you are doing that, you will see that the A and C lattice parameters are changing, and they are changing in different ways. And overall, there is uh, an isotropic volume change, which can in introduce uh, strain inside the battery particles. So you consider this as a bigger particle, you have volume expansion about a few percent. 
um, is different from other electrode materials such as silicon, which has much larger volume expansion. Whereas here we have only a few percentage volume expansion, but that few percentage volume expansion could be already quite detrimental to the battery performance. Um, now, I said that we are interested in understanding how does the bulk particle perform redox reactions. So for example, if I have this big secondary particle and I want to maximize the capacity that I can get out from this particle, I ought to have the oxidation reactions or the redox reactions in every single region inside this secondary particle. So collectively, every single transition metal in there, here is nickel, uh, can contribute to the capacity. However, uh, this earlier study done by Dr. Tian and Maka Duf at, at um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, so they synthesized these polycrystalline materials and they used two different methods to oxidize nickel in the material. One way is electrochemical delithiation, which is a practical battery. You, you put the electron materials, you electrochemically charge it up to a certain voltage. The other way of doing that would be chemical delithiation. So you, you soak your particle in an oxidative environment to oxidize nickel. No matter which method you use, you are seeing very heterogeneous charge distribution. So the color here represents different state of charge done by transmission X-ray microscopy, which will have a, a, a little more introduction in later slides. So it's very heterogeneous. The heterogeneity will eventually lead to the local stress buildup and you have the cracks formation. And here's just give you some examples of, of cracks. It's again, very heterogeneous. If you look at the battery electrodes, there are millions of battery particles and each individual particle will behave slightly different from each other. That's because their local environment is different. Every single particle, they will be charged and discharged in a different fashion. And this will bring up the challenge that we need to have a technique that's able to do this kind of study in a very uh, statistic uh, representative manner. Um, so how do, we, how do we modify the electron material that can benefit, that can improve the thermal uh, the, 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 the chemical mechanical stability and also homogenize the charge distribution. So this is my graduate student, uh, John Ray. Um, he came up with this idea that if we can design uh, electron material that have different grain orientation. For example, if we can design one that each individual grain will be pointing towards the center of the secondary particle versus this gravel kind of design, which the primary particles are randomly orientated. So by having these two different structures, we should be able to investigate charge distribution, oops, sorry, um, charge distribution, chemical mechanical properties, and electrochemical performance. So based on the uh, final element modeling done by Professor Ke Zhao at Purdue University, um, they, they, they build out this, build up this model, rod NMC and the gravel NMC. So the NMC is nickel magnet cobalt. I, I, I explained that earlier. Um, and we are focusing on the nickel to be close to be 80% of the transition metal to give us high energy density. So they are doing the modeling by taking lithium out at different state of charge. That's the SOC here. So 100% means we are taking 100% of lithium out in practice, we know uh, taking 100% lithium out from these materials is in practically impossible because the structure is very unstable. Um, however, based on the theoretical calculation um, here, um, we found that if we have this rod orientation, it's able to homogenize the charge distribution and also eliminate the local stress high spot, uh, uh, hot spot. Um, how can we synthesize this material? So uh, Jenray uh, went ahead and synthesized these two different materials using chemical methods. And one with this radial distribution of the NMCs, which we call rod uh, NMC. The other one is the gravel, the orientation is quite random and lithium diffusion path is tortuous. So having these two materials in the same chemical composition um, and also the same 
uh, uh, crystal structure as well. So this will give us the baseline to, to investigate how the grain orientation will change, how this battery finish charging or discharging. Um, in terms of performance, we found that um, the, uh, the raw materials provides uh, better stability. As you can see here, we test the performance for about 100 cycles at, at, at one C rate. So we are getting capacity. Their initial capacity is very similar, right? No much difference. But if you look at that polarization curve, as you go longer number of cycles, the polarization of the gravel NMCs is much more significant compared to the raw NMC. Um, so, and we know that earlier we have this similar crystal structure, and I will give you the introduction for this bulk nickel oxidation state and surface oxidation state in the next slide. Uh, the only difference between these two materials are really the grain orientation. So there must be something related to between uh, grain orientation and the battery performance. So uh, we went ahead and we collaborated with uh, Chen Jun, uh, who is also in the audience today, to first understand how does the grain orientation change the bulk behavior. So the hard actual absorption spectroscopy, which is very nicely done. We can do this in situ, we can do this as situ. Um, we didn't see any difference between these two materials. So the pristine state, the 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 the, the, feed, the the spectra are almost overlapping as we are charging it, they're overlapping as well. We don't see big difference. Um, the surface chemistry is important, so why don't we probe the surface chemistry as well? So we did the uh, soft actual absorption spectroscopy with Dennis Nordland. Um, Dennis is a beamline scientist at uh, SSLR 10 1. Uh, we collaborate for a little over 10 years now, and we have published probably over 50 papers together. Uh, the conclusion based on that, no matter what kind of detection mode we use, uh, 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 the uh, TEY mode is the uh, total electron year mode or FY mode for essence mode. Uh, both are probing uh, quite surface region compared to the hard access. And we don't see difference at, at each given state of charge for these two materials. So no difference is found in this ensemble average measurements, so soft and hard access, because they are probing many particles and nickel oxidation states are, are quite similar. Um, so um, this is the baseline characterization we know, what we, we expect to see, they are not seeing, we are not seeing difference. Um, so at this point, I think I'm gonna take a break uh, to answer any questions from the audience before I move on. Thank you, Fung. Um, one question is, uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about how you achieved the different texturing of the, the two micron sized particle. Well, the, the gravel AMC is quite easy. So uh, mostly if you are doing co-presentation co reaction without any additional surfactants, you will get gravel distribution. And the, the majority of papers in the field is about this. Uh, the, uh, the, the orientated grain orientation will take a little extra efforts, uh, which I, we believe we need, we need to have surfactants to guide the growth of the precursor. So the, the texture growth is started already in the precursor growth in the solution phase. Okay. Um, another question for you is um, uh, the science here spans many length scales. Yeah. And so with the, uh, uh, the fourth generation synchrotrons coming online with, with uh, multiband achromat and so on, um, uh, where do you see the biggest benefits are going to come from the higher brilliance of the synchrotrons in the context of your chart you have up now of the different length scales? Um, well, length scale is one thing. Um, and uh, if we go down to very, very small length scales, electron microscopy can do some of the work. Um, I would say if we can do the measurement at a faster rate and capturing the metal stable phases, the metal stable chemical information during the fast charging of a battery, that would be fantastic. And also improving the statistical representativeness of the, of the experimental results could be also another important uh, advancement. Okay. Uh, there's a question about um, how did you get the three-dimensional state of charge maps? Uh, I will explain in a few minutes. Okay, all right, we'll come, we'll come back to that. 
Yeah. And uh, last question is uh, whether um, you only showed us the zanes for the uh, rod and gravel XAS data. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question whether the extended XFs was similar or different for the two systems. Yeah, they are very similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they are very similar because they these both are uh, XFs and zanes are probing the electro level, and they are they, they are both electrodes are reaching the same state of charge. So it's, it's an average effect of many, many nickel ions and mechanism cobalt. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right, thank you. You should continue. All right. Um, now uh, comes to that uh, we know there's no difference based on this bulk characterization. And based on our hypothesis, we think that could be the grain orientation is changing the way the secondary particle fin is charging. So, um, so we here, with, this will end answer the question about how we do the state of charge mapping in three dimension. So uh, we collaborate a lot with uh, Dr. Yijin Liu at Stanford and also his many students, including uh, uh, John, uh, uh, I, I include here. Uh, they are doing fantastic jobs in, in terms of uh, getting uh, the transmission X-ray microscopy in three dimension and also performing high throughput data analysis, including machine learning kind of capabilities. Uh, so we, we are very happy that we had a chance to collaborate with them. So by doing this transmission X-ray microscopy, we are essentially rotating the sample, the particle uh, to different angles and capturing the uh, transmission uh, X XAS at each individual pixel. And then we reconstruct that to form three-dimensional uh, uh, visualization of the state of charge. Um, uh, Eugene has published a lot of papers in this field, so if you want to know the technical detail of how this thing operates, and, and you can go to his Google Scholar and to discover more. But uh, that's on the technical side. What we discover on the charge distribution is that, now that, let me take the electrochemical profile for these two different materials, for example. Uh, I have rod NMCs and the graph NMCs. So I can start charging them from the same open circuit voltage and to the top state of charge. And both electrode materials give very similar charge capacity to 237 versus 241. Essentially, that's within the experimental error of a typical research lab. So we, we consider that uh, they, they, they are giving the same capacity. However, if we are doing the map for the state of charge distribution for these particles, and these are representative particles from, from many particles that we screen. Um, from the rod versus the gravel, if you can zoom in locally to look at the local regions, you will see that the, the red spots representing the higher state of charge. And this is using the nickel cage, the, either the 50% the absorption or the white line, in, white line peak position to represent the uh, the, the energy. So if positive means it's highly charged and negative means it's less charged. So the, the, uh, the rod has this radial distribution and this is just, you know, the, the overall looking at the individual region, uh, but that's not statistically representative enough because I can always pick up a region that give me this feature. So how do we develop a method to, to understand statistically the, the, the charge distribution. So um, John Ray and John, uh, they developed this mathematical model. So I'm not going to be uh, too, too deep into how we come up with this model and how we do this model, but this model will give us two pieces of information. Number one, we will define vectors of the charge gradient vectors. And that vector will give us the charge heterogeneity is basically each individual voxel inside this particle. And how different is that voxel comparing to the neighboring voxels in terms of the state of charge? If the difference is large, that means you have a high large, large charge heterogeneity. And we are having about 20 million voxels in this particle. And we can do statistical analysis based on this so many uh, voxels. And we can also get the angle of the, to, 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 to infer the charge distribution. So these are the two pieces of information we can get out from this analysis. 
And these are the snapshots of the, the vectors in, in two dimensions. Just to give you some idea, if you have radial distribution of the highly stable charge, uh, you will expect the vectors pointing 90 degree uh, uh, to, uh, against this direction, up and down direction. Whereas if you have random distribution, the vectors will distribute, distribute randomly. So we did that for 20 million voxels inside the particle. And we found that the, the mathematically, um, the vectors for the rod shape, the majority of the vectors are distributed along the 90 degree. That, that just represents overall the charge distribution, it's the radial distribution on the charge. And also the vector size is smaller compared to the gravel. So this means the charge heterogeneity in the rod is much smaller than in the gravel. So this is our uh, example of how we utilize the transmission X-ray microscopy in three dimension and how we implement advanced mathematical modeling to understand the charge distribution, charge heterogeneity in this material. And this, we believe, partially explains why the raw materials have better performance because you can have smaller charge heterogeneity, less buildup of mechanical stress. And we are advancing the study with more uh, investigations, for example, looking at thermal stabilities as well in these materials. Um, so that's the land scale uh, I cover on the bulk electric chemistry part. And uh, I, I want to briefly touch on the surface chemistry part of the doping part of that, of the how single cell actuaries have, uh, have helped us to understand this. So uh, this is an effort, we consider this as the low cobalt or no cobalt nickel rich cathodes. So there's a driving force for us for, uh, to get rid of cobalt. Uh, just because Kubo is toxic, I mentioned earlier, and also expensive. Um, for this layer oxide materials, it's very typical when you charge the materials, transition metals get oxidized, like the example I gave earlier, nickel gets oxidized. However, the oxygen orbitals are transition metal orbitals, they are hybridized. So you are affecting how oxygen orbitals behave as well. So here is the one example of the oxygen K edge, looking at the pre-edge feature, and if we are removing about 60% of lithium from the layer oxide, we are seeing increased intensity for the hybridization. That's because the, the oxygen 2p orbitals are getting more and more influenced by the transition metal oxidation. So this is strictly from uh, the orbital hybridization kind of theory. But having the oxygen activated in this way is not good for the stability because then oxygen can react with electrolytes and then especially at the electrical surface. So how do we uh, retain oxygen? Because when we have this, we will tend to lose oxygen at the surface. So the idea we had was for each individual's primary particle, we have a surface doping and they form agglomeration in this kind. So um, uh, uh, James uh, Steiner went ahead and synthesized some of the materials with gradient distribution of dopants where the titanium is enriched on the surface. We believe titanium has stronger bonding with oxygen so that it can retain oxygen on the surface better. And the electron microscopy characterization was in collaboration with Professor Hollinging at UC Irvine. Uh, with that being said, we put in uh, titanium on the surface, we are getting better stability. Um, we also expanded the, the, uh, uh, the characterization for how the titanium surface doping will enhance the stability. First of all, we found that the titanium bonding environment is quite stable. That's done by the titanium, titanium arrow edge, actual absorption spectroscopy. Upon charging, you see the peak gets uh, wider and upon discharging, it gets narrow. That means the titanium oxygen bonding environment is quite reversible as a dopant. Um, and also the oxygen pre-edge based on the area quantification is also quite stable as well. Uh, we expand that to cobalt free cathodes, uh, the cathodes that uh, do not have cobalt in there, which we turn that to Virginia Tech Gen 2 uh, under part of the DOE project. So here is an example, we are tuning uh, titanium and magnesium distribution. So magnesium turns out is quite uniformly distributed in the particle, whereas titanium is still enriched on the surface. And 
we perform a single trial x-ray scat uh, diffraction and refinement and we also perform neutron uh, scattering and refinement as well to figure out the specific lattice site of these different dopants okay so single trial and neutron are collaborating quite well for this uh, for this uh, idea um, the summary of the performance uh, to date, uh, we are able to get the cuboid free cathodes, magnesium titanical doped cathode, to perform at the same level as the NMC A11 titanium. So that's moving away from cuboid and having nickel contents at the 96%. Uh, we are still advancing this uh, to get more uh, data on these materials. So that's uh, that's about my my uh, our work and the and the lithium ion batteries and. Um, I think I will have another break to take any questions. All right, um, that was uh, uh, that was really interesting. So you're seeing there are some um, advantages to having the rod oriented texture. I'm mm -hmm. curious, have you tried to look at that past 100 cycles um, yeah. to try and find bigger? Uh, 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 longer term consequences of the reduced mechanical strain? Yes, uh, we have the mechanical data for uh, longer number of cycles which I do not include here. Yeah, um, for that kind of study, uh, if we are looking at uh, electro particles, I can see here, right? So this is the electro, at the electro scale, we are seeing millions of particles and here we have uh, thousands of particles as an example. Uh, we really need to have statistics to, to get reliable interpretation of mechanical results because individual particles, they, they might perform differently. Uh, I understand that, but just electrochemically, when you go past 100 cycles, do you start to see more and more advantage to the radially um, textured particles? Because we are driving the voltage to a uh, very high voltage to about 4.5 volt. Um, at this high voltage, um, with, within 100 cycles, we will see both material will degrade quite quite significant. Um, if we back that down to about 4.4 or 4.3 volt, I believe we will see more benefit for the for the uh, rod. Okay, um, Yulia Pushkar, you have question. Uh, yes, thank you. Very nice presentation. So basically, my group we work on highly oxidized, uh, high oxidation states in metals, mm -hmm. like you know, metal double bond oxygen reactive species to make oxygen oxygen bond. Yeah. So I know that there are some discussions that there's uh, highly oxidized metals like let's say nickel four uh, uh -huh. might be relevant for battery chemistries. <clears throat> so my general question, the kind of uh, whether we whether you have seen any of those. And then uh, to this um, oxygen KH data. Mm -hmm. So basically you show, again, like if we are making metal oxo species, yeah, they will change the oxygen KH. Obviously, like you see indication of increased hybridization of oxygen with the transition metal. Mm -hmm. And uh, you showed us later after this slide, the titanium improves the stability so my question is whether you have seen effect on this spectra of oxygen on oxygen KH from the doping with titanium. Oh yeah, so uh, here I give you an example here. I didn't uh, go very deep into this. This is the pre s quantification of the area of, uh, of, the, of this area. And, and this area is related to the strength of hybridization. And for our system, when you get nickel oxidized to higher oxidation state, you are going to have the pre edge intensity much stronger. Um, uh, however, if you have the surface degradation, it forms a rock salt phase, for example, forms a nickel oxide phase, the pre edge intensity will be much weaker, right? So, and then once you form the rock salt phase, it's not reversible. So uh, based on our area quantification of the pre edge, at least for the first few cycles, we're seeing that it's becoming very reversible for the surface oxygen. Now, if we go beyond that, to hundreds of cycles, I can tell you exactly what will happen. The surface will still have degradation. So just to summarize that I understood correctly. So uh, like if you go to the previous slide, okay, okay. So basically in this activated case, if you will have a titanium, the <laughs> spectrum will not change, yeah? Um, because we have, we have only, uh, 
uh, two to three percent overall. Whereas nickel, we have much larger in percentage, at least eighty percent. Sometimes we are ninety six percent. So the pre S feature is dominated by by the nickel. I understand. And what do you think is the nickel oxidation state, at least formal? Uh, that's a very good question. A lot of people think that the uh, nickel would be in the four plus, which we have never observed. Um, which obviously nickel four plus is very unstable. Um, uh -huh. and there are people uh, using uh, standard spectra for nickel four plus, which I'm, I'm not sure whether I will agree with them. Uh, I can tell you, we have had nickel four, um, like when we do in C to electrodes for water splitting. Yeah. Uh, we have a data which look pretty much like nickel four, but we can discuss it offline later if you're interested. Yeah, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be great because the second, the, the final piece of uh, slides will be on the water oxidation catalyst. Oh, great. Excellent. So Thank I you. Will have, I will have that as well, uh, but which we are not looking at the nickel uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the absolute nickel oxidation state. Uh, but obviously, for example, in the nickel hydroxide cases, upon charging, uh, upon uh, electrocatalysis, they are on nickel four plus. So uh, the final piece of information I would really want to cover uh, in, the, in the final a few minutes is about a material that's very old, uh, it's nickel iron hydroxide. This material can date back to uh, Thomas Edison in his uh, nickel hydroxide batteries, which is more than 100 years ago, all right? So uh, people are becoming interested in this material, looking at how this material can catalyze water oxidation reactions. Uh, uh, to promote the, the electrochemical splitting of water, right? So in this water splitting reactions, you split water to form oxygen, and this is the perfect case, uh, like uh, uh, the oxygen-oxygen bond uh, formation. Uh, it involves four electron transfer. So anytime in electrochemistry, you have four electron transfer, that means kinetically, it must be very slow. Um, for a lot of our battery materials, we are looking at lithium ion intercalation, we're looking at one electron transfer. Okay, um, this uh, is exclusively, exclusively dominated by the surface chemistry. So the catalytic reaction happens on the surface. So basically then you're putting this electrode in the electrolyte and what happens at the electrode surface at the interface will be very critical. And that's the part we are covering for the next few slides. So how do we study catalyze the surface chemistry under operating conditions? So if I have a bulk material like this, multi-layer bulk materials and I'm trying to categorize what happens on the surface and obviously you know uh, in the old days people use hard access uh, even in the transmission mode and trying to get conclusion for the catalytic mechanism uh, uh, but you know the, that that would not be representing the, the the surface chemistry or at least the surface chemistry is not a big component of the final result and, uh, and people are developing hard XAS on the, in the refraction mode that helps a lot. Uh, we take a different idea. Can we use soft X-ray S? Um, the answer will be no, uh, because uh, we want to un operate this under operating condition. It's quite hard for X -ray, soft X-rays to, to penetrate the cell components. Um, so how about hard X-rays for surface chemistry? If we design atomically thin samples, people are doing atomic layer deposition, to form very thin layers, so the surface chemistry is dominated in the hard X-ray as spectrum. Uh, so we have a different idea if we design a thin material enough, for example, this two layer, bilayer metal double hydroxide, then we should be able to study the, the, the surface chemistry. So how do we design this material? Uh, this is a graduate student, Chung Guang Kwai, he has done an amazing job in developing this material. In, 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 and one of the ways that he is developing is that if you look at this layer double hydroxide materials, uh, they are, the layer structure is very similar. They, they are essentially the precursor for battery materials. And in between the layers, layer double hydroxide, you can house a lot of metal sp uh, ion species in between the layers. So for example, here, he put ethanol into the, uh, soak the sample in the ethanol solution uh, suspension and then and sonicate it and uh, it's able to somehow exfoliate. We don't fully understand the mechanism yet, but it's able to exfoliate it into this two-dimensional structure with double uh, uh, layer thickness. So this is the uh, uh, atomic force microscopy demonstrating the thickness of this individual nanoplates. And this is the transmission electron microscopy. You don't see 
huge difference in terms of the contrast between the material and its surrounding carbon grid, um, just because it's very thin. Okay, ideally, if we have this material, we should be able to perform electrochemical catalysis and every single site could be electrochemically active, then we can use hard XAS to, to, to categorize the catalytic reactions under operating conditions. 100% exposed active sites, that's what we thought, if the material is stable. If the material is not stable under electrochemical cycling, which is usually the case in any electrochemistry, the materials will undergo, will undergo transformation. Okay. Now, um, here I want to give share with you some of the very recent results. Uh, we are looking at the degradation behavior of this material. So uh, we have different ways of testing the performance in electrochemical cells. One of the ways is through electrochemical cycling. So uh, it has a cycle of chemistry, CV. So you are seeing this takeoff and that takeoff is the initiation of the oxygen formation. So that voltage, uh, the, the potential, we can use that potential to signify the overall potential we have to overcome. Okay. We, we can also measure the cycle of chemistry for many, many cycles and investigate the stability of this electro at different current density, so if at different voltage. Um, so if we are talking about this current density, uh, uh, the voltage is very stable. So basically under cycle of chemistry cycling, we are not seeing much degradation over a number of cycles. However, if we are doing CA testing where we hold the electro at a certain potential and run it for many number of hours, we are seeing great degradation of the electrons. So that must be some scientific question that we need to answer. Different local structure, chemical changes of the electrolyte, electrocatalyst, whereas the, uh, the, in the CV cycling, we have this cathodic reduction polarization. Does this reduction polarization reverse the structure and chemical degradation caused by the anodic? degradation, whereas the CA you always hold at the high voltage, 1.62 volt. So it doesn't give you this in chemical environment to reform the catalyst. So first thing to do first is to measure how does this nickel manganese, uh, sorry, nickel and iron would uh, perform or behave at the larger length scale, the electrolyte length scale. So are there any speciation or segregation between these two different metal systems. So we went to Argonne National Lab and collaborated with Lucy uh, using X-ray fluorescence microscopy under operating conditions. Um, so this is a map. Uh, the map is representing the nickel to nickel and iron uh, atomic ratio. As you are start to see this very hot spot of, of red, that means you have a significant segregation of iron from the lattice, from the matrix. And we can do a bit of more better quantification of the result as the peak distribution gets broader. That means you have uh, more iron segregation from the lattice. So from here, we can see that from the CA measurements, we have start to see from the pristine state, MNF is the mixed nickel iron hydroxide. It's the material that we discuss here. Um, Upon CA cycling from 12 hours to 18 hours, we are systematically observing the peak broadening. That means we have larger metal segregation from the, C, from the CA test. Whereas the CV test, the peak broadening is not as significant. Okay. Now, from, from the structural standpoint, uh, we can obviously operate uh, actual diffraction as well, but we found that actual, actual diffraction is not very sensitive for these uh, small changes. Uh, but the hard XAS sometimes can tell us a little bit about the structural information. So here we have uh, pristine material and charged to 1.6 volt. If we, if we look at the pre edge feature, looks like this gives us a bit of indication that pre edge of the charged sample uh, resembles the feature for iron oxyhydroxide. So it looks like this is an indication we have the segregation of the iron from the lattice. However, if we perform 
a recovery process. Recovery process can be done in many different ways. You can soak the electrode in the electrolyte for a while, or you can perform the cathodic, or cathodic reduction. When we do that, we found that the structure is able to partially recover. That means in this recovering process, we are able to put iron back into the lattice. And from the uh, XFS analysis, it also give us quite similar information. So it looks like the, the incorporation and the segregation is somewhat reversible in this material. Um, and uh, Chunguan went ahead and performed uh, a better visualization of the result through wavelet transform uh, to understand, to dis differentiate the neighboring of uh, iron iron neighboring versus the iron nickel neighboring. Um, it turns out that uh, upon uh, charging to the highest state of charge, 1.6 volt, the iron nickel coordination, or not coordination, the neighboring is disappearing. Uh, upon resting, recovering, uh, we, we have that uh, showed up again. Uh, these are just snapshots of experimental evidence showing the reversible uh, segregation and incorporation of iron into the lattice. Okay. Now, um, how can we utilize this reversibility? Um, so uh, we designed this reversible phase segregation to enable revivification of the electrocatalyst. Be just because the iron segregation and lattice incorporation is reversible. So the way we do that is we did a, did a control experiment where we hold at the high voltage continuously and then we are seeing this degradation of the current. That's what we saw already earlier in the slice. However, if we perform intermediate reduction method, method so we, we hold at the 1.63 volt for a while and then we reduce that to 1.33 volt to initiate the reduction process of the electrode, getting iron back into the lattice just for two minutes. And then we go back to the operating, operating mode again. Now we are able to sustain the cycle life of nickel iron hydroxide, just based on that phenomenon. Okay, um, so that's the, 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 this part. Now, the next question to us is, uh, the segregation, is it related to the, the dissolution and redeposition? We know metal hydroxides in the electrochemical system, they are not stable. And you are forming a pH gradient at the interface. So the pH environment at the electrical surface might not be favorable for the solid state nickel iron hydroxide. So maybe there's a dissolution and redeposition process occurring related to the, to the lattice incorporation and the segregation. So uh, Chun Guan did this experiment. So he intentionally add iron into the electrolyte. And now through the XFM mapping, we are seeing the incorporation of iron to the edge side of nickel hydroxide. And the iron concentration continuously increase as we go for longer number of cycles. And this is cycle using cycle photometry. So it looks like the dissolution and redeposition uh, in the electrolyte is related to what happens on the electrode surface, which is the lattice incorporation and uh, segregation. Okay. Now, uh, experimentally, we also go, went ahead and doing electron microscopy and mapping the distribution of iron. Indeed, iron uh, species are enriched at the, at the surface. So iron is preferentially absorbed to the surface and which might form the active site for these materials. Now, are we discovering something new? Uh, these are experimental evidence for something we think that might have happened. Now, if we go back to uh, the, the question is for the, the answer to this question is yes. Now, if we go back to the literature, uh, go back to Thomas Edison's age with more than 100 years ago, when he designed uh, the nickel hydroxide batteries, he used negative electro as iron. So what he discovered was, in his system, he wants to have a battery to operate, which means he wants to have this reaction happens, but not having oxygen gas evolution. However, on, on those days, he used um, uh, negative electro iron. It turns out that iron will have rapid dissolution in his electrolyte, and the iron will incorporate it into nickel hydroxide lattice almost immediately and making the, his electrode materials to become extremely good for oxygen evolution reaction rather than for batteries. 
so that was a challenge that he observed earlier, and here we just the experimental evidence to show that uh, it's consistent with what he uh, was uh, discovering. Now, um, how does the iron incorporation would do to the to the electrochemical performance? Um, here uh, is a CV cycling for uh, without irons, you have this huge over potential. You need to have a voltage potential and higher potential in order to have a little bit of takeoff in the current density to to have oxygen reaction or uh, oxygen evolution. When you, when we add iron into it, we are seeing a uh, big decrease of the over potential. Meanwhile, we are seeing the decreased capacity. That was something that uh, Thomas Edison didn't want to see, but this is something that we want to see. That we want to incorporate iron to reduce the 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 to reduce the capacity, uh, and reduce the battery behavior, to have more uh, uh, electrochemical catalysis behavior, and the reversibility of nickel redox becomes better as well after uh, incorporation. That's because that's you can see that from the oxidation charge and reduction charge, they're get, getting much closer as you, we incorporate iron. Okay, so uh, the take home is the OER performance increases with the nickel redox reaction and iron lattice uh, incorporation. So that this resonates the echoes with our uh, results in the, in the previous slides that the iron segregation is forming active sites on the surface and dissolution and reincorporation is a very dynamic process. Um, so with that, I, I would like to conclude, uh, I run through a, a few different projects that take advantage of different single x-ray techniques Number one is the grain orientation, the charge distribution uh, management. Everybody is talking about developing new electrical materials for batteries, which is great. However, we believe there's still a lot to explore in the old materials because we have not yet fully utilized this old traditional materials. There's still about 30% of, of energy density we can, we can aim for. And homogenizing the charge distribution in the particle maximizing the contribution of individual nickel ions in the particle to the capacity uh, will be a key, to, uh, a key way to go. And uh, we also try to tailor the dopant distribution in battery particles to spontaneously improve the surface and bulk stability of high energy layer cathodes. Uh, metal segregation the, the, the solution uh, takes place during electrochemical cycling. Uh, I gave you the example of electrochemical catalysis, but really this happens in, in the battery as well. Uh, uh, last piece of information, uh, the metal redeposition lattice incorporation. If we can really operate the electrochemical interface in a very good way, we will be able to perform in situ modification of electrochemical energy materials. And this will be extremely powerful for electrochemical catalysis where the surface crystallinity is not a key uh, requirements for the, for the reactions because the reaction is based on the molecular motive. As long as we can in situ form certain kind of molecular motive, we can have uh, chemical reaction, uh, just chemical catalysis reactions. With that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and uh, work cannot be done without collaborating with a lot of singletron and neutron user facilities in the US and outside the US as well. And my collaborators and those names in red are specifically acknowledged here because they contribute to the scientific content of this presentation. And my research group, uh, they, are, they, are, they are doing different kind of work, uh, but they're contributing a lot to, uh, to the success of my research group. Uh, the funding support, the, the battery work that are presented, supported by uh, both NSF and, uh, and the DOE, uh, the catalysis work is supported by our internal resource at Virginia Tech. With that, I would like to conclude and thank you so much and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Fang. It was a wonderful talk. We're running a touch late, but Matthew Marcus, you had a question about uh, dichroism. Yes, this goes back to uh, to the particles and the uh, the radial orientation, and that is, I was thinking with the TXM that uh, you could observe not just the oxidation state, but the orientation in the same particle. <laughs> If there's a strong enough dichroism, the nickel L, uh, nickel K edge, excuse me. So it would be tomography with polarization. Well, um, that's a that's a that's a great idea. Uh, that's obviously a challenge to to really probe the grain orientation using uh, using TXM. Uh, we haven't tried that. 
Yeah, the but, analysis would be complicated. Yeah, it's but very complicated, yes. The Swiss light source people seem to have been making progress along those lines. Oh, that would be awesome. Uh, that would be awesome. I'll be happy to take a read, take a read on the, uh, their, their website and papers. Yeah, it's actually, uh, they haven't been doing so much linear dichroism as, as circular dichroism, which is simpler in some ways. But then again, they've also looked at uh, tensor tomography in diffraction, and the math would be similar. Yeah, yeah, that'll be, I think I, I, I came across a paper on nature communications about, uh, they're doing diffraction imaging for polycrystalline particles to figure yeah. out the orientation in three dimension. Um, right, so what I'm yeah. suggesting is doing it in X-ray absorption contrast. Do you think the contrast will be large enough because we are on the beam path, we have multiple, uh, many, many grains overlapping? I don't know. Also, I don't know how strong the dichroism is at the, for this material. Okay, that's a great suggestion. I will, I will follow up, definitely. Thank you, Matthew.